before it's like you had to design stuff in Photoshop and then export everything. But now everything seems to have evolved quite substantially. Forget everything you knew before. Forget about selecting images. Forget about generating images. Just, you can just use text and just load the topography that you want. Layout in CSS in the web has changed quite substantially from when I started. I remember it's like, it was like table layouts and stuff like that. Um, what do you think about the evolution of layout on the web? I guess we've learned from print and we've taken their, you know, their technologies or their paradigm and we're just trying to make it work for everyone in the browser instead of just his print, his browser with this never ending stream of text yeah. <laughs> that works very well for like doctoral thesis, but possibly not for documents that people want to read. But I think it's, apart from painful and, you know, long and draggy, I think it's very exciting now because you can't predict what people are using or how they are reading that. So you have to be designed for this wide gamut of options. And I think that's very interesting. The layout is fin finally like supporting you in that so that, you know, designers don't hate browsers. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think about CSS Grid and Flexbox? I think that's generally exciting. And, you know, Flexbox got up to like a bad foot because there were like three or four implementations. Well, yeah. I think two or three. Um, and none of them were really compatible. So that quite didn't work. With Grid, I think we, we learned a lesson and finally everything gets together at the same time with all the browsers. Yeah. Um, so that was good because you, you know that it's supported in phones, yeah. <laughs> which is what, again, most people use to browse. Um, so it makes it so much easier. Like once you grasp how it works, it's very easy. Whereas with, you know, with floats and all the things from your, <laughs> it yeah. was really, really hard to do. And you had to add lots of extra markup that makes it very hard to maintain. So nowadays you can have very simple layouts, which are very easy to understand and maintain, which I think is important. It's not just like building it, but also being able to change it afterwards and not having to add more and more CSS to override the previous CSS. <laughs> I remember when I first was getting into coding, it's like the thing, the tool that really helped me understand it was like when Firebug was like the first developer mm -hmm. tool and then uh, Firefox had the developer tools integrated. Mm -hmm. um, and that really was like, it was the aha moment. Now I understand the box model. Now it makes it. Yeah. When I saw um, the developer edition, like your, the layout tool for Firefox, I was like, this is amazing. Now I can, I can finally see, like visualize the code, which I always found was like, why haven't we had this tool in the beginning? Like this was, this is exactly what makes perfect sense. Like at the beginning, the tools were basically for the engineers in the browser to be able to diagnose what, what's going on there. But now we, we add them lots and lots of visual features to like, you know, like CSS to the engineer, everything. Yes, you need to diagnose. And I have seen tools that engineers have built where everything's flashing. Yeah. <laughs> like using like all these free layouts or these redrawings, but that's not actually useful for designers. So that's why we need designers to be involved in designing the tools as well. Yeah, so that we are giving you tools and information that is what you actually need rather yeah. than what the engineer needs. Like the engineer maybe just needs to diagnose how many phones are there in the system and how many glyphs do they have. The designer doesn't care about that. Yeah. The designer might want to see what you were mentioning, like variable phones, what can I use here? Where, where are the things I can change? So I think, I think that's very interesting. Like it just takes us from as a browser maker, it just takes us from like, okay, I'm an engineer and providing you this feature to you, to, okay, how can I make this feature useful and accessible to you and so that we can all work together and you can make best use of this feature I have implemented for you. Yeah. Because it, there is no point, right, in implementing a feature if no one's using it. But the thing with tools is, um, in typography, it's like the thing that uh, ruined it for a lot of typographers is when Photoshop and these design tools made it really easy to change the font sizes. Because mm -hmm. back in the days, like you would have a specific font for mm -hmm. uh, font size 14, and the, 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 the metal plates would be very different for 18 and whatever. But then when you had the design tools, you just changed the size. And it almost, for classical typographers, for like, this is really irresponsible. You're destroying it by creating these tools. Mm -hmm. We've reached a similar point now with variable fonts, where you have, if a typographer um, designs all these settings, and you expose this, to the developer, they could end up doing really bad things, like things which are illegible, thinking, oh, this is really cool. Um, so as, as a tool maker, I mean, what, do you, what are the considerations that you think that you need to think about? OK, OK. On one hand, I'm very open to people going totally wild and just like getting creative, because that's part of what motivates me to work 
on Mozilla. Like, yeah. I want everyone to be able to do whatever they want to do on the web. Like, if it's tacky and ridiculous, all the better. Like, just think 90s, GIFs, colors, all very psychedelic. I'm fine with that. Like, we look back on that and we're like, oh, those were the times. So maybe <laughs> once variable fonts get in, we will be like, oh, this was so much fun. And then people will go like back to like very minimalist and like very composed website. I I am not against that. But then if I get into this kind of like maternalist mode, I'll be like, OK, let me help you. And let me tell you, like maybe you want to build a tool that says, hey, maybe you're adding too many variations of this font. This can be a bit overwhelming for people with certain disabilities, yeah. or this is not readable, or, you know, like kind of like the two sides, like you can be very creative on the web. And also like maybe you can advise people. They can take or not the guidance. <laughs> yeah, totally. But as, as browser makers, we have this unique insight on this is not going to work well in certain circumstances. And I think also, as Mozilla, we have this responsibility to be like, hey, you know, some people can't withstand this kind of like flashy colors. Um, so we can maybe warn the user. We are not doing that yet, but we are maybe thinking of maybe doing that because you know what's been rendered and what is being parsed. So, you know, the features are active. Um, so we should use that data instead of just like passively um, display the output. You want to give the, the the users of the browser, which may be the developer, which is slightly different mm. from the user, for the tool side, you want to give them um, the control and power, but at the mm. same time making sure that they consider the real users of the tech. Yeah, and it's also cool because we, you know, with um, with the newer features that were added to to animations in CSS, you can control them with JavaScript. So you can do things like, well, this user has selected not to have animations. So if they have selected to have less motion, I can reduce the animations, go oh, back wow. to a more consider and compose kind of typography and distract them less so they can be more, you know, able to access the content without being interrupted by my flashy creativity. So I, I guess it's cool that we are giving them all this control, but also we need to let them know that there is all these considerations they should have in mind. It feels like we're in the golden age of our sort of industry. Yeah, so maybe Flash was kind of like the article era, and we are now in the Wild West. We just need some more time and give maybe more libraries, more support, and also, I guess, giving people the license to just do whatever they want, yeah. because otherwise it's like the, you know, the, the JavaScript police comes and says, like, you're doing this wrong, this is not how it should be done. Yeah. There wasn't that much of that in the Flash era, so people were giving themselves the license. No more freer. Creatively. Yeah, because people were not like looking at your code. Oh, look at that using that library, that's terrible. Yeah, though. yeah. So I guess we're missing a bit of that kind of like tool set for creatives. Um, but at the same time, I, I think the, the layout tool that is in uh, Firefox, yeah. I, think that, I think that's the future, like where people, hmm. d the bridging the gap between turning the browser into a design tool Mm -hmm. Rather than just a, 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 cons a, a consumes, yeah, <laughs> a consumption or viewing tool, yeah. um, and I think that's um, where once that is nailed, I think everything will change or will fall into place, perhaps. Yeah, I, I mean that's one of the things that we're trying, and I guess Chrome and Edge are also trying. Like every time you publish a feature, you want to make sure that the support and the tools is there, so that it's exposed to users and they can, you know, work with it and edit and also. Every person learns in a different way. Yeah. So some people well, might prefer some visual tools, or people might just prefer code. Like some people like clicking, others like typing. So I think it's very cool that we're showing this kind of like visual interface for designers who are thinking of layout, not just thinking of you know column and tracks and names of tracks, <laughs> which is very abstract. So I guess that's just the first step. Step. We're now talking like these 2D screens, but then you're like, what happens if we take reading through into 3D? There are all these means that we can use. It's, it's interesting to start thinking about, but how do you design tools for inspecting 3D worlds? That's a that whole makes level. sense. Yeah, like even because it, it starts involving like attention and psychology and like all this, you know, like all the science of perception, like if I'm looking at you, if you were a web VR object, if I'm looking at you very intensely, I guess I should be double clicking on you because that's what it yeah. would be conveying. But like, maybe I'm just like glancing at things and it doesn't mean that I'm interested, it means that I'm like curious, but Not how do you, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's like, 
it's interesting and scary as well. <laughs> People tend to assume that their customers or their users are all like them. Um, but you have to get out of that mindset and it's really injurious to the health of the web if people just code for one browser. <laughs>